Good afternoon, everyone. The time now is one o'clock. We will hold for just about another minute or so while we wait for other folks to log on. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I am Jenna Shasson, the Assistant Superintendent for the Office of Teaching and Learning here at the Department of Education. And I am happy to be able to provide for you all some updates on today, April 1st. So we will dive into the agenda. And we have an agenda today that includes some reminders as well as some new information about teaching and learning as well as funding and enrollment. We also are very fortunate to have a guest speaker on today. Dr. Finger from Children's Hospital of New Orleans will be joining us later during today's call to share some updated information. So just a reminder about our COVID-19 resources, some updates here on this slide. Um, we have a new COVID-19 landing page and library. We have also recently updated our FAQ document to include some additional questions that we have been receiving from you all. And so just a reminder about our COVID-19 resources that live on our Louisiana Believes website and are linked here in this slide. So we'll begin with some COVID-19 related updates. Just a general update on the vaccines is now everyone in Louisiana ages 16 and older is eligible to be vaccinated. Reminder that this is at no cost to the individual. Also that having a large portion of our population vaccinated is our best shot at a return to normalcy. So we are encouraged that Louisiana will receive enough doses to vaccinate everyone who wants a shot. And I will say in the last few weeks, I think we have seen um, that the availability of the vaccines really makes a lot of us hopeful um, about the next few months to come. So the vaccine distribution is occurring at the local level, and we have linked here on this slide a list of vaccination sites that LGH has published. And just a reminder that appointments to receive the COVID-19 vaccine must be scheduled, and walk-ins are generally not allowed.
For business supports related to COVID-19 updates, the LDOE is providing the following supports to help strengthen business practices. Tax consultation with so many fiscal changes in the past year, early learning centers may be seeking tax consultation. So we are connecting to type three providers to support from tax accountants and certified public accountants. We are also offering some business trainings this summer on budgeting, fiscal controls and marketing. And linked here on the slide, you will see our early childhood newsletter that contains resources that help childcare businesses save time and money in the shared services section of that newsletter. The Child Care Management Software Initiative is to support efficiencies through automation and early learning centers. The department will provide an 80% reimbursement for a type three site using child care management software for up to $800 reimbursable dollars in one calendar year. In addition to fee support, we will provide implementation and data entry support to new users. Another business support available is a substitute directory. The department will launch a substitute directory pilot built on top of the existing child care criminal background check system and pay for the first 300 eligible substitutes. New regions will be added to the pilot monthly starting in June. Retaining and attracting providers are RAP. To help ease the transition of new type three providers, the department is providing one-on-one -on -one consultation guidance and direction to resources and hosting by hosting a monthly interactive office hours webinar. This will take place on the last Friday of every month at 10 o'clock a.m. and is linked here on the slide. You can learn more about this webinar through our early childhood newsletter. If you all have any specific questions about these business supports I have highlighted today, you can contact shallon.jones at la.gov. Earlier this week, we released our Believe Early Childhood Planning Guide, which outlines activities and funding opportunities for early childhood community networks to develop plans and partnerships to ensure these four activities. Child care is stabilized immediately. Communities increase access. Teachers are prepared to lead classrooms and provide high quality interactions. And young children who experience disruptions in learning this year are given opportunities to prepare for school. So early childhood community networks will be working with child care centers, school systems, and Head Start partners to begin developing and implementing these plans. So just to note that this BELIEVE framework and the resources and documents that are linked in here are all part um, of the planning um, and partnerships around ESSER II and ESSER III funding received by the state. So this BELIEVE planning framework is meant to support lead agencies in planning and budgeting for some of those stimulus dollars. So a few LACAP grant updates. We will offer additional LACAP relief grants for providers. As a requirement of receiving the grants, just a reminder that providers agree to use health and safety practices that prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the child care environment based on the guidance from local and state health departments and the department, which includes those OPH guidelines. So just a reminder here that anyone who has received or continue to receive those LACAP relief grants, part of what you are agreeing to is that you are following the guidelines put forth by local and state health departments and the LDOE to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So just wanted to highlight the importance of that um, and the knowledge of you all that by receiving those grants, you are therefore agreeing to do those things and put those mitigation efforts in place. So the 2021 LACAP relief grants release dates um, are seen here on this slide. We do have round five for type three and family homes that are still anticipated to be distributed this week with the CCAP supplement the week of April 12th. Please note that this is a holiday weekend, of course, and so local banks may have delayed deposits as a result of that. Also, our non-CCAP certified providers, um, round one of those LACAP grants are anticipated to be distributed the week of April 19th. 
A few additional grant opportunities to highlight today is that we will have, we do anticipate other rounds of the LACAP relief grants to come during the months of June, September, and December of 2021. And some additional grants to highlight are the Early Childhood Teacher Stipend Grant. These are for type three centers to apply for a grant to provide teacher stipends to supplement teacher pay during the pandemic, as well as the Accountability Participation Grant. And this as well as for type three centers that participate in class observations this year, both local and PCARD center observations, will be eligible to apply for a special grant to offset additional costs and the administrative burdens um, that you all employed by participating in the accountability system this year. A few licensing updates. Just wanted to highlight the importance of having a written behavior management policy, describing the methods of behavior guidance and management to be used at the center. And the behavior management policy um, shall prohibit children from being subjected to any of the following. And you see the list here on your screen, these bulletin items. And just wanted to reiterate the need um, for centers to develop, implement, train their teachers, and utilize this written behavior management policy. This is so important to keep our children safe. So please ensure that you all are developing and implementing a written behavior management policy and that you are providing training and support to your staff on this plan that you have developed. A note here is that technical assistance from Tulane and from your CCRNRs is available to all providers. Another important licensing update and reminder are those motor vehicle passenger checks. Um, the temperature is continuing to rise outside. We're seeing some, some really nice weather, but we know pretty soon that weather will turn into some very high and hot temperatures for us here in Louisiana. So just a reminder about conducting those visual passenger checks of a vehicle. Reminder that these are required. It is so important to keep our children safe in vehicles. And so just a reminder that that staff person needs to physically walk through the vehicle and inspect all seat surfaces under all seats and in all enclosed spaces and recesses of the vehicle interior. As with your behavior management policy, please ensure your staff receives proper training and repeated training and support as needed to make sure that those motor vehicle passenger checks are being prioritized and conducted. A note on continuing education hours. Early learning centers are required to obtain a minimum of 12 clock hours of continuing education per center anniversary year. The waiver of Bulletin 137 issued in July 2020 did expire on February 28, 2021. And so as of this past March 1st, Early learning centers are required to obtain a minimum of 12 clock hours of continuing education per center anniversary year. As a reminder, all trainings shall be conducted by trainers approved by the department. So a reminder that that waiver was in place, but no longer is as of March 1st. Um, so please take the necessary steps to ensure that those required 12 clock hours of continuing education are received. And some upcoming events to announce today. Miss Vicky. Uh, yourselves, make sure you're on get the background noise. All right. So Teacher Leader Summit, the virtual series. So we are offering a virtual Teacher Leader Summit this year, which is really exciting. And this is just to expand the amount of people who will be able to attend the Teacher Leader Summit since we do have very much reduced numbers to our in-person event. And so the virtual series will take place from June 1st through the 11th and sessions will be accessed remotely. The format will be similar to the virtual series that was held last spring, 2020. We do have a max overall registration limit of 8,000. We do anticipate probably filling all of those 8,000 spots for the virtual series. And registration for the virtual series is on a first come first served basis. 
we are not allocating seats. So it is a first come first serve for anyone who wants to register using the link here on this slide. And the prices for purchasing tickets are here. Um, we have an early bird registration for the month of April through April 25th. And then regular registration will open on April 26th until the date that we sell out. Again, we do anticipate selling out of seats for the Teacher Leader Summit, the virtual series. So we would recommend and encourage everyone to register sooner, get that lower ticket price for early bird registration, and also make sure that you have a spot. I'll also note that for Teacher Leader Summit, the virtual series, we are um, planning to offer, as we build the schedule, we're planning to offer some um, non-traditional hours. So we're planning to offer even some evening sessions. So for those of you who are tied up with little ones during the day, um, are there are some things that interest you that you want some of your staff to attend? Um, we are planning to offer for the virtual series some evening hours as well. All right, so I am thrilled to introduce and welcome Dr. Finger from Children's Hospital New Orleans. And Dr. Finger has just been a really amazing partner to the Department of Education throughout the entirety of the pandemic. And we're really happy to have him on today to talk specifically about a few updates to OPH guidelines, um, talk a little bit about where we are with the vaccines and where we are with some of the mitigation efforts um, and where we go from here. So Dr. Finger, are you there? I am here. I'm not sure how you get me videoed if you need me to, or I can just stay and talk. So thank you, Dr. Casson. We can see you, Dr. Finger, that's perfect. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you for the nice welcome here. I appreciate the invitation uh, and the leadership uh, for all these folks over the last 13 months. I hope to provide a little bit of clarification for maybe some minor changes that will help the folks on the phone for the next several months and also look at maybe some potential changes that might be coming in the summer and the fall. So first of all, uh, just to cover uh, broadly field trips, I think we can, uh, what I would suggest, um, and this will be uh, updated in the current guidance is that we still cancel or postpone special events such as festivals, holiday events, and special performances. But I do believe at this point in the pandemic that we can allow field trips to occur under certain specific conditions. First of all, centers should adhere to all current transportation group size guidelines by the phasing as indicated in the charts that they all should already have. Uh, events should be outdoor activities, even at this point in time and then adhering to the outdoor group guidelines that all the centers have as well, while maintaining masking and social distancing by adults who accompany those field trips. So I think that's great news. I know it's not the green light to go and do everything, but I think understanding that we're still not completely out of the woods um, yet, and we haven't avoided uh, the, we're still not quite at the end of the pandemic, but I do think in discussions with the Office of Public Health, this makes sense to allow some relaxing of the field trip guidance at this time. In addition, I understand that for the past 13 months, one of the major barriers for sort of incoming um, students at the centers is that it's been challenging to allow potential parents to visit the center and that it's hard to get parents to sign off on something for a building that they might have never seen before, staff that they're unable to interact with. I think at this time, we should consider allowing tours for potential new parents uh, virtually before and after center operations or physically with the following stipulations. And by physically, I mean in person. We shouldn't do large open houses for groups of 10 or 12 parents at a time. What we should do is allow for scheduled parents or guardians to visit the center one household at a time. We should continue to screen those visitors just like we screen everyone else with a temperature and symptom check before they come on the campus. They need to wear a mask and socially distance the entire time. And we would ask that they not enter a classroom or an area indoors where children are present. I think that will uh, obviate any potential uh, conflict with close contacts and keep all children and team members who are on the school campus safe. 
if the children are outside, the parents should feel free to go into a classroom with the guidance of that child care center team members. So I think this is something I heard loud and clear from Lisa when I discussed with her some of the major limitations over the last 13 and 14 months. And I hope that is able to give your team members some sort of guidance moving forward into the hopefully final part of the pandemic over the next several months. Um, I'm happy to pause there, Dr. Chasson, and take questions, or if you'd like me to just move into sort of the vaccine effort where we are now with uh, everyone over the age of 16 and potentially the effect of what it looks like moving forward for kids younger than age 16. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Finger. This is incredibly helpful. We haven't received any questions in the chat yet, but I have a clarifying question. I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding correctly and that everyone on the call has is hearing this. Um, so you are saying that field trips for outdoor activities with proper mitigation efforts um, and safety controls there. So outdoor field trips are a yes, but indoor field trips are still not allowed. That is correct. Okay. Just wanted to make sure I was hearing that correctly and that everyone else on the call was clear on that as well. So outdoor field trips are a go and indoor field trips, no. I think both of those, um, both of the bullet points that you've already covered are really exciting. Um, and I feel like we are, we are happy to take what we can get at this point. I know both of those items have been really concerning and especially the potential parents not being able to visit centers um, has been something I know has been a struggle this past year. So I think that's really, really great news that we'll be able to welcome parents back in with those controls that you just mentioned. So yes, happy for you to, um, we have a question. Oh, yes. So one clarifying question that we had about when parents are doing, new parents are doing these visits to centers, um, should they be welcome to bring their kids along with them? So should they be welcome to bring their children to visit the center as well, or should it just be parents allowed in? Uh, I'm trying to think back several years to when I did those visits. I did them without my kids. I don't know what the right answer is. I think for all intents and purposes, um, let's say just parents only right now. I think that's not unreasonable because they're not going to, it's not like the kids are going to interact with other children at this point. And that brings in another layer of complexity that we probably don't need to foist at this time. Okay, absolutely. Thank you for that. So yeah, if you don't mind going on to your other bullet points. I, sure. I think some of the questions are mostly not for tours, but can parents walk their kids to their classrooms at this yeah. time? Ah, okay, so right now we're gonna stick with the drop-off outside. This We did discuss this at length uh, last week, and I think the Office of Public Health uh, feels strongly at this time not to change that part of the guidance at this point in time. So to do the drop-offs outside of the facility or however you've been doing them um, without going inside. We, again, we recognize that the continued vaccination efforts across the state are increasing and our, local, and our prevalence rates are going to knock on wood continue to decrease. So we will revisit that um, you know, periodically over the upcoming weeks and months. Great. Thank you, Dr. Finger. Sure. I think it's not, I, I will, while I'll go into the vaccination efforts, which I believe, Dr. Chasson, are incredibly exciting. Um, as we know, they're open for everyone in the state above the age of 16 years and older. Um, right now, uh, you know, different regions of the state have different sort of prevalence with how many people have gotten it, but well over a third of people who are eligible have gotten the vaccine. Uh, and it's even for older adults, far greater percentage. Right now, the you know, we've, I've known for several months that the data on kids aged 12 to 15 has looked incredible. And I think many of you might have seen that it finally made it to CNN this week. That doesn't mean that kids 12 to 15 are going to be able to get the vaccine this month but there's a huge push to hopefully have that subpopulation of children, i.e. over the age of 12 years, eligible to get the vaccine before the fall academic semester starts. Uh, the, some of those are two, two dose series, so it's unclear when that's gonna start, but very, very exciting. The majority of the other studies um, that are ongoing now are for kids six months and older, um, I anticipate the next bucket might potentially include all kids aged six months to 12 years after that. 
it's likely that that will not happen in calendar year 2021 but early in calendar year 2022 is when the optimistic thought about when that might happen is. Again, the, uh, you know, the vast majority of children who get this disease get it from an adult household contact or for teens and kids in their young 20s, I'm allowed to call people in their young 20s kids at this point in my life, they can get it from each other. But the children that we're talking about who attend these childcare centers, get it from adults in their household. So by increasing the vaccination rates for adults across the state, it's clearly going to prevent children from getting COVID-19, which is a huge, huge benefit. Um, we've already started to see marked decreased positivity rates in children, even though they're not the ones who are getting vaccinated because they're unable to catch it from the adults who are walking around with the disease. We all know that the effects of COVID-19 on children are far less severe clinically than they are in adults. And we've seen that borne out in the state of Louisiana. It's matched the national and international data almost exactly. We do have clusters of children who get very sick. The vast majority of those kids are, are survive and are healthy but we have had a handful of deaths in children under the age of 21 in the state of Louisiana, the vast majority of which have had severe underlying chronic illnesses as well. So, uh, you know, even though this is a um, disease that has not hit kids as much as it has hit adults, we have seen some kids get very sick. By and large, they all recover, and everyone that we have been able to follow up with has no long-term sequelae uh, from this disease. So that's very exciting and good news for the pediatric population. Thank you for that, Dr. Finger. And we have a few more questions that are coming in just around some of the mitigation efforts that have been in place. And if you could just talk through, are there any changes at this point to any of, the, any of those mitigation efforts that were in guidelines in months past? Are we seeing any shifts? So specifically around temperature checks, specifically around when children are sent home um, for being sick, for things like a runny nose, that timeline when they come back. Are there any significant shifts happening right now at this point in time? It's a, it's a great question and one which I get asked several times a day. So I should be capable and answer it uh, at this point. Let me just, it might be helpful to step back and explain to you and the audience how those decisions are made. First of all, Although there are federal guidelines that come out from the CDC, we rely heavily on our partners at the Office of Public Health to help interpret those. And luckily they've invited me and the Department of Education to have a seat at the table to discuss with them as those guidelines are formulated. I think in the state of Louisiana, we were ahead of the curve since we, if you remember back to last March, were an early you know, sort of source of COVID-19 so had to jump ahead of the game and had created a lot of guidelines along with our colleagues in New York and Seattle before the CDC made these guidelines. So we've really been sort of ahead of the curve or on par with the CDC and how those guidelines have been rolled out. But just because the CDC has stated something doesn't mean it's immediately adopted by all um, facilities in the state of Louisiana. We digest that and our partners at the Office of Public Health look at all the data and then determine what's the right thing for the state of Louisiana. That being said, uh, as the Department of Education crafted guidelines that were adopted by Bessie last summer, some guidelines were adopted formally by Bessie and some we've allowed to be able to change over the course of the pandemic as new information has been made. Um, the at, as of this time, we have been hesitant to de-escalate a lot until we see that the numbers for our current curve continue to go down and we do not see what's happened in parts of Europe to have the increased prevalence count that they have. I anticipate if we can get through the next two to four weeks without seeing an increase in prevalence counts that we will begin to de-escalate some of the measures that you alluded to and are probably getting asked about in the questions, i.e temp screening and symptom screen, mandatory symptom screening before coming on to the campus. We had one final question that came in to the chat while you were talking, Dr. Finger. 
And I think it's a pretty good question. People are planning for their summer programs. And so um, there is a question around if guest speakers, if they are masked, if there is social distancing in place, if guest speakers could be allowed into summer programs to speak to the children. I will say off the cuff that I anticipate that would be something that I will strongly recommend uh, that we allow to happen. Okay, that's good news. <laughs> All right, any other questions I'm looking? Um, we had a question about, are there any current vaccinations um, for ages 13 to 15 year olds? Are we seeing vaccin vaccinations come down the pipe for that uh, span of kids? There, there's none that are currently approved, but both Pfizer, Moderna, and even J&J, &J, although the Moderna and J&J &J data aren't public, I've been able to see their initial data and they all look very, very promising with close to the same effectiveness as in the uh, young adult to adult age group. So they're not approved yet. And by approved, I mean under an EUA, which is what all the other, uh, the current vaccines are. So able to be given. So not quite yet. All right. Well, Dr. Finger, thank you for joining us. This was really helpful information and we thank you for taking your time to be with us today. Thank you. Have a great day, guys. So from here, we will close out. Um, our next slide shows the date and time of our next webinar next month. So a reminder that we are making this a recurring monthly webinar with updates for providers. So we will meet again on Thursday, May 6th at one o'clock. So be sure to tune in and join us. And we will, next slide is the contact info that you all are used to seeing every month from licensing, CCAP, um, certification, child care criminal background checks, and our general early childhood support email address. So if you all have any further questions, please put them in the chat. We will check and see if we have any other questions coming in. All right. I think nothing else at this time. So wonderful. Thank y'all for joining us. Thanks again for all the work that you do. We were so glad to have Dr. Finger on today. So thank you for those continued mitigation efforts. You all um, are absolutely such an important part of that equation as we see our numbers go down across the state. So thank you for all that you do. And you all have a wonderful, possibly long weekend. <laughs>